And we spent a pretty good amount of time on the second, uh, uh, second section, which is um, um, st strategy or requirements. I do apologize uh, for um, having, not having my mic on, those of you that are watching the recording. The first couple minutes of class, I was answering a student question about being able to repeat backgrounds. And there's a background repeat property in CSS that you can say if you don't want your background image to repeat. I just mentioned that I spent a lot of time talking about goals, a lot of time talking about requirements. The rest of the three phases are going to go by quickly. All right? So don't be afraid that, gee, it's going to be November before we finish talking about the design document. And there's a reason why so much time is spent on the first couple of phases. And that reason is just the nature of software development. And this is probably true for other kinds of projects as well. Like if you think of, of building a building, all right? If you think of that kind of project. With software development, the earlier in the project that you find a problem or find something to correct or find something that changes, the easier it is to make a change. And that should probably make sense for you. Uh, the best analogy I can think of is building a house. If you build a house and you want the room to be 12 feet by 12 feet instead of 8 foot by 8 foot, all right? When you're still planning the house and your, your, your architect is sketching out the design on, on paper, it really isn't that hard to make a room a little bit bigger. It might add a little bit of expense, but it's not that hard. You, you essentially just change the drawing of the room, and there you go. Can you imagine if you actually had built the house and you decided you want the house to be a little bit bigger? When they built this building, look at you know, the wall over here. There's the wall to the outside. If they wanted to make the wall four feet further out, when they were planning the building, that probably wouldn't have been that hard to do. They could do it. And it would be a little bit extra expense, but no big deal. If they wanted to do that now, just think of the expense and the trouble that it would cause. You'd have to shut down classes in these two classrooms at least, maybe on the first and second floor of this building. Um, it would require breaking down what was already there adding on and then finishing it up, the expense and the trouble would be a lot more expensive. Software is like that too. The earlier on in a project that you find a problem and address it, the easier and in terms of businesses, easier translates to cheaper it will be to correct. Almost all software development follows a graph like this. This is the cost to make a change to the software. Cost of change. This is the phase that the software is in. OK. We have sort of the planning phase. oftentimes called analysis. Then we have the design phase, which is also sort of a form of planning. Then we have the phase where we're actually building the application. Then we are testing, and then we have implemented it. If we decide we want to make a change to the software early on in the game, it's just like making a change to a building early on in the building process. Doesn't take a lot of expense or trouble to correct it. The further on we go, it increases in expense. If we've already built half the building and we decide we want it to bigger, it's going to be more expensive than if we hadn't built any of the building yet. But still not quite as expensive as, uh, as it would be if we had finished the building. 
This graph goes like this, curves up. Uh, if you are a mathematical person, this has a positive first derivative. All right. Something like that, you show it. Which means that it is increasing at an increasing rate. This means it's increasing at a steady rate, at a constant rate. This means it's increasing, but not only is it increasing, the speed at which it increases also increases. From the beginning of time when people start, first started writing software, the graph looked like this. This is just the nature of software development. All right. So this means two things. And I usually give this little mini lecture in every one of my classes at some point. All right. This, had, this impacts a couple of things. First of all, the time that you spend in this phase of the project is important. If you spend a lot of time in that phase and you have a very clear idea of what exactly you want, that will minimize the changes that you have to make. And it won't eliminate them. Software changes for any number of reasons, right? Some of which are totally out of your control. All right. Uh, two companies merge. Well, they have to change the website to accommodate that. The government makes a change uh, in the law for payroll calculations. Well, your payroll application has to change to accommodate that. Some changes are because of you didn't think of everything you needed, or maybe there's a bug in the program. So some of the changes you can eliminate, some of the changes you can't. But the bottom line is the earlier you find these issues, the better and more effectively you can address them. So you want to spend a lot of time um, planning before you actually do something. It's like, uh, I forget which woodworking show it was, maybe the New Yankee Workshop or one of them home repair issues where the, uh, shows where the guy says measure twice, cut once, right? Well, the extra time that you spend measuring, making sure it's correct, is going to pay off, right? Because you can't easily redo cutting a piece of wood, all right? Well, software may be a little more forgiving than cutting a piece of wood. There's still extra expense involved when you have to go back and redo something later on in the process. The second thing, second implication that, that we, can, uh, we can gather from this graph is that we're going to develop good software practices that is going to make changes easier. All right. Maybe this is the graph for an average software developer. A poor software developer, the graph might go like this and the cost really skyrockets. A great software developer, the graph might go something like this. Still has the same shape, but it's less of a dramatic of an increase. So if we adopt good software techniques, then we can sort of flatten that curve a little bit and make changes less expensive. That's why we do things like put our CSS in a separate file. Right? That's a good programming practice. Why is it a good programming practice? Because it makes it easy to change. Most of the things that we have, and this is true in, in any of your programming classes. Some of you I know are taking um, um, C Sharp, intro to C Sharp. If your professor says it's a good idea to do this, there's a good chance that is a good idea because it makes it easier to change the program later on. Give your variables names that mean something for example, in C-sharp. Why do you do that? Well, so when you come back later to fix a program, it's pretty easy to figure out what's going on. You know? Put comments in your code. Why do you do that? Well, when you come back later to change it, it's easier to make the change. Divide things into functions instead of having just one big giant chunk of code. Why do you do that? Well, when you have to come back later to make, you know, every one of those good programming practices centers around or most of them rather, I won't say everyone, but most of them center around making it easier to make a change when you need to change something. And change is inevitable. 
All right. Even if you've done everything perfectly, external conditions are going to require you at some point to make a change. So you want to do a good job so that, yeah, it's going to be expensive to make the change, but it's going to be cheaper than if you did a poor job. So because of that, we're measuring twice and then cutting once. All right. We're trying to do that anyhow. That's why I spent so much time in these two areas, well, in these areas, to define the goals that the organization has, define the goals for the users, and define the things that uh, are, we're going to put on our website, specific kind of content that we're going to put on our website to achieve those goals. So that is the first two phases of our design process. So that's what we saw over the last couple of days. I'll pull it up just to review. And then we'll move on to the third phase. Strategy, we define, we give an overview of the project. We define three personas. We define goals for each of those personas. All right, spent a lot of time about that. Spent a lot of time on what personas are. Scope, we define requirements that we're, in other words, we define specific content we're going to put on the site that's going to help us achieve these goals. Again, specific content, not something like, well, I want the website to be user friendly. What does that mean? That's, that's sort of a, it doesn't relate to the, the, the specific content you're going to put on the site. Of course you want your site to be user friendly, unless there's some really strange circumstances like you're, you're making I love bees, where you want to make it deliberately confusing for effect. All right? But most standard business sites, yes, you want them to be user friendly with a very clear navigation. All right. So I wouldn't count that as a requirement. The requirements relate to the content that address the goals. If I was a new band, for example, and I wanted to gain an audience, what might be some content I could put on my site to attract some new fans? One of my personas is a person that's unfamiliar with the band, for example. And one of my goals is to attract new fans. What is some content that I would put on there? Yes? You could put sample clips, right? You could put 30-second um, or one-minute sample clips of some of your songs. You could put a video, all right? How many of them are you going to put? Are you going to put videos or audio? All those things are decisions that you have to make, all right? And what you would do is you would consider your organization and you'd consider your audience and come up with the best mix of stuff that would um, help attract new listeners to your band. All right. So the scope section is specific content that you're going to put on your site that will help you achieve those goals. Every piece of content that you put on your site ought to relate to one of your goals directly or indirectly. Now, it might relate to multiple goals, and that's fine. All right. Um, someone who is checking out a band to see if they like them or not might want a video clip. Someone that knows that they're a fan of the band might want a video clip. A club owner that is trying to decide should they book this band might, be, might want a video clip on the site that would help them achieve their goals of deciding whether to book the band or not. So a video clip on your site of a song that you've performed at a club might address three different goals. 
goals of the someone that's unfamiliar with the band, goals of someone that's a fan of the fan of the band, and goals of a club owner trying to decide whether to book the band or not. So one requirement can address multiple goals. By the same token, one goal might have multiple requirements associated with that. Should be detailed. The more specific you make the requirement, the 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 better off you are. All right? Because remember, this document that you're this design document that you're creating um is done for many purposes. It's done, first of all, for you to get your thoughts on paper so that you've really thought through what you want on the site and aren't just winging it. But it's also used to communicate to other people that are involved in the project. If I was a consultant brought in to do a website for a band, for example, I would want to communicate to the band what I plan to do. That way, if I omitted something or they had an issue with something, we could talk it out before I build it. Again, why? Because of that graph. I might also have someone else helping me on the site. All right? And I might, when I'm done with this, I might hand off the specifications to a junior web developer to create some of the pages. All right? Well, if I do that, the more specific I am in defining the requirements, the better off everyone's going to be. So instead of saying, I'm going to have some video on the site, all right? Some video, wow, three different people could read that and come to three different conclusions. I could think that I mean a 30-second snippet of one of the songs. The band could think that I mean a hour and a half concert video that shows the band's entire set. A developer might think that I mean a collection of five different videos of five different songs. So we might all have a different idea of what some video means. If, however, you say there will be one, there'll be two clips each showing one song, song A and song B from the band, then there's little ambiguity about what it is. Everyone's on the same page. The band can look at it and say, yeah, that sounds right. Or no, let's, let's put three on instead. Or oh, no, let's only put one on. We don't want to give away too much to people visiting our site, for example. And the junior developer who takes on the project knows exactly what they have to do. So the more specific that you can make the requirement, the better off you're going to be. All right, I think we talked about these. Remember that as a project proceeds, it's OK to make changes here, All right? It's OK to, whoa, wait a minute. You know, we forgot about this, so let's do that instead. It's valid. The project specifications give you a roadmap. And on any roadmap, there can be detours, right? So therefore. Um, these are not carved in stone. The, the, this design document is a tool to get you where you want to go. All right? Okay. The last three are going to go quickly. All right? In fact, I probably spent more time reviewing the first two than I'm going to spend going over the last three. The first one is a structure chart. All right? A structure chart shows you how you're going to divide your content. In other words, what pages you're going to have and how those pages are going to be linked together. All right? You could have different content on the same page. Um, would that be considered? still you would break that out because it's a completely separate topic but related to that page? No, this is, this is just looking at the overall structure of the page okay. and, and effectively how many pages you're going to have okay. and how they're going to be linked together. Okay. Can we use the same strategy as, uh, as structuring and uh, this tab like put a portfolio to? Well, the 
portfolio is fairly well defined what you need to do. All right. So you don't really have to go through um, the planning stage quite as much. It's pretty well rigidly defined what you need to do. You can certainly make it look however you want it to do. And you can certainly organize your page, your page however, or page or pages how you want it to be. But the, but the difference between the final project and the portfolio is the portfolio is very specifically defined what you have to turn into me. The project is very open-ended. In other words, you get to decide how it's going to be structured and how it's going to be laid out. So that's really the difference between the two. Now, a lot has to do with how you're going to categorize the stuff. Let's say we're going to do a website for a sporting goods store. All right. What are some different ways that we could organize the products in a sporting goods store? Let's just brainstorm for a couple minutes. Yell out just anything that you think of as a way of organizing stuff on the pages of a web uh, of a sporting goods store. Okay. So, what would uh, give an example of what you mean? Okay. Okay. So, one way would be to have a home page and underneath the home page have shoes, tennis rackets, bicycles, weights, golf clubs, basketballs, etc. So organized by product. What's another way we could do it? By sport. So in this case, we have home basketball, and we could have shoes and basketballs, golf, we could have golf clubs, golf balls, ugly plaid pants, and so on. All right, so this is by sport and then product. What's another way we could do this? Doesn't have to be a, a great way, it's just everything we can think of. By brand. By brand. Absolutely. Home page. Nike. Reebok. Adidas. Fila. <laughs> Converse. That's that's my that's my middle school brand. So brand. What's another way? By season. By season. By year. Okay. Let's think of by season first, then we'll talk about by years. So, so I can I can see what you mean. So we have home and we could have spring sports. What are spring sports? Well, track is. And I'm thinking mainly based on the high school season, right? Uh, baseball, I think, is a spring sport. Uh, summer would be probably baseball, golf, softball. Fall would be football. Um, winter would be hockey, skiing and so on. It will be another way. You said by year. What, what do you mean? Okay. By, by time of the year. All right. Okay. Excellent. Um, anyone else think of one? Repeat that, please. By gender. Okay. Home. We could have, in fact, we could do this by sort of combining gender and age and saying women, girls, men, Boys, women split into apparel and equipment, girls being separated into apparel 
and equipment, men being separated into apparel and equipment, boys, same thing. Now, all of these are logical, right? No one, no one said have the products sorted in alphabetical order, right? Because, you know, I, I guess that's logical in the sense that golf clubs, gee, that would be in the G section, you know, or would it be in the C section for clubs? I, I don't know, all right? But all of these are reasonable, right? Um, by gender and age, by product, by sport and product, by brand, by time of year, all of these make sense. One nice thing that we can do on the web is we can have the same content organized a couple different ways, right? Um, provided, of course, we don't confuse the issue and make it difficult for people to use. So for our example, our pages that we're going to do are small enough where we're just going to have one sort of structure for the page. So we have to decide, if we're writing our website for a sporting goods store, which one of these we're going to take. How are we going to figure that out? I'm not asking for the answer of what, which one you'd picked. I'm saying, how would you figure that out if that was your job? Look at the competition would be potentially a good thing. All right. Um, if someone's already thought through a problem, it probably is a good idea to at least look at what they did. Um, of course, they might have got it wrong, right? So you, you never know, all right? But that would be a good, that would be one good thing that you could, you could do. I would, I would definitely say that would be worth doing. What would be another thing that you could do? Well, you want to go back to your personas and think of the goals that the people have and think of what structure would help those people organize their goals. For example, maybe one of the personas that you have is a parent that wants to get their kid ready for Little League in the summer. All right. Well, that would sort of suggest some organization that would include sport, right? Because, gee, they need a baseball glove, they need baseball sh uh, shoes, they need a baseball bat, they need maybe things to practice baseball with, and so on down the line. Now, again, that's just one persona and one goal, all right? But you would look at all those personas, look at their goals, and try to come to conclusions by looking at it from their perspective. All right? Looking at it from the perspective of your personas. If you have enough time and money, you could even interview people. You could even create a rough prototype and let people take a look and try to figure out to see what organization the site is. The bottom line is you don't necessarily do what makes sense for you. You try to do what makes sense for the user. And I'll give you a good example of that um, using uh, LC's website. Let's say, for example, you're a high school kid that is interested in computers. All right. What division on campus would you go and visit? You're interested in computers. What division would you go and visit? Here's a list of the divisions on campus.
All right. Here is a list of our academic divisions. Arts and Humanities, Engineering, Business, and Information Technologies, Health and Wellness Sciences, Science and Mathematics, Social Sciences, and Human Services. If you were interested in computers, which one would you go to? Yeah, I forgot they changed the name of the division. <laughs> there used to be two separate divisions, engineering and business, in which case it was confusing. Here's the thing, though. There are actually computer programs in at least three of these areas. And which division that you'd want to visit would really depend on what you're interested in doing. So if our website was only divided by division, you're liable to confuse some people because they're liable to go to the wrong place. Someone's liable to go to engineering, business, and information technology and say, well, I'm interested in computers, yeah, but I'm really more interested in computer graphics and gaming. And our offerings for those aren't included in engineering and business. They're in math and they're in arts and humanities. So what we have actually is we have a separate IT page that if someone is interested in information technology, I'm interested in computers. What are my options? It lays out different options that you have. And you can look at it and see, hey, which one of these am I interested in? And you don't need to know what division it's in. You can just say, hey, well, I'm interested in interactive and digital medias. And I can go and click and see what my options are. Uh, computer animation, graphic design, computer games and simulation, that sounds interesting. And I can go to it. And I don't have to know what division that is to get to there. So a better way to organize programs for high school students that may know, gee, I'm generally interested in this field or that field, but don't know how the college has divided the coursework would be to divide it this way. Here's a page about computers. Here's all my options. Doesn't matter where it's offered on campus, it will get me to that section correctly. So this kind of organization on this page was made with the potential users in mind. All right? I have a hard time keeping track of what's offered in what division. And I work here, all right? So you can imagine someone from the outside world coming in and trying to figure that out. It's not necessarily straightforward. But if they do know I'm interested in computers, this is what I'm interested in about computers, a page like this will help them. A page like this is constructed from the perspective of the personas in the problem. All right. That's why I wish I would have uh, grabbed the um, quote uh, that was on the, on the page uh, uh, from last class where it said, I started becoming a good desi web designer when I stopped designing for myself. All right. What that means is you stop looking at it from your perspective and look at it from the perspective of the potential users. So that's how you decide how you're going to divide your information. All right. Not from how you see the problem, but how you think the users uh, solve it. So getting back to our project design doc, what you're going to do is you're going to say why you chose to categorize the data that way. So I might say that I chose to categorize the data by sport, right? Because gender isn't always valid, right? I mean, is there a girl's baseball bat and, or a girl's softball bat and a boy's softball bat? No, right? There's different sizes of them, and depending on the size of the individual, they might use one or the other. That's not really a gendered item, all right? Um, separating it by sport, well, here's a plot twist. If you're a worldwide company, when do you think they ski in South America? They ski during our summer, <laughs> all right? Because uh, beneath the equator, um, the, the, the seasons are flipped. 
So they might play softball in the winter. All right? So just a twist, you know. It's, the whole world isn't, you know, doesn't have your perspective on things necessarily. All right? But I know I want a softball bat, right? That I know, you know. So let's divide it by sport. That might be the conclusion I came to, all right? That I'm going to divide it by sport because no matter what all these other things are, you know, maybe golf is a summer sport, but gee, in nice places, in Hawaii, they probably golf all year round, so it's not really a summer sport exclusively in Hawaii or whatever. So maybe I decide I'm going to break it down by sport. So I'd explain why I did that. And I would put that very explanation that I just had. That, well, seasons aren't always reliable because uh, some sports span several seasons. Some sports are played in different parts of the world in different seasons and so on. Gender is not always reliable because of golf clubs, you know. Uh, golf club is based more on the size of the person, not necessarily uh, the gender. So maybe gender's not really a good idea uh, to, to separate things for. But sport, yeah. Uh, if I'm buying golf clubs, I know I'm buying golf clubs. I know I don't want to look at softball bats, for example. Although softball bats do an extremely effective job of driving golf balls if you've ever hit a, a golf ball with a softball bat. Um, so I would explain why I picked that, and I would then create like a hierarchy chart. And it doesn't have to be elaborate, but just breaking it down into the pages. Like maybe this is my home page. And then I have a page for golf, softball, football, soccer. Etc. All right. Now, to your question before, what if I had two different kinds of content? Like, what if I had soccer balls and soccer shoes? Well, if they were on the same page, I wouldn't really do anything other than this. If they were on different pages, then I would show them like this. I'd show them like that. So it relates to the pages. So you're going to come up with a hierarchy chart that looks like this, that just looks sort of like an organizational chart that specifies what pages you have and how they're related to each other and how they are linked to each other. And you're going to explain why you picked that layout. Because remember, for almost any topic, you have, uh, you have choices in how to divide the topic up. If I was doing a website about jazz music, I could divide the material by era, for example. I could divide it by era, the 1900s, the 1910s, the 1920s, the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. Or I could divide it into major styles, you know, New Orleans jazz, big band jazz, bebop, um, free jazz, jazz fusion. Or I could divide it into uh, instruments, saxophones, drummers, guitar players, vocalists, and so on. Any one of those is a reasonable way of dividing it. I'd have to look at my personas to decide which the better way is. If I was doing it for musicians, for example, I might divide by instrumentalist. So saxophone players can look up information about other saxophone players. If I was doing it for maybe a history of jazz class, maybe I'd divide it in by the different styles by, or by the different time frames. That's the structure chart. Next thing is a wireframe. The wireframe is simply a sketch that shows the main sections of the page. Now, a lot of pages have wireframes that look like this, or similar to this. All right.
right? That's all a wireframe is. It's a chart that shows the main sections of the page. You don't have to go in details. You could put other notes, like maybe on the header, the logo here goes here. Um, there's a search bar here. Maybe the footer contains copyright notice and email. But it's just sort of a very rough sketch, an overview of how the page is laid out. All right? Now, maybe all of your pages have the exact same structure. All right? In that case, you only really need one wireframe. You don't need a separate wireframe for every page. If my sporting goods store, if all these pages have the same basic layout, then I just need the one wireframe. If, however, there's a page that's different for some reason, there's a different layout, then I would have a different wireframe for it. For example, on many sites, the home page is laid out differently than the rest of the pages. Maybe all the content pages look like this, but the home page consists of a giant image and the navigation here and a banner going down the side. All right. Maybe the home page has a different layout than the other pages, in which case I'd draw a different wireframe. Or maybe there's something like a gallery page on your site where you have a header, navigation, footer, but then a series of thumbnails and the big picture. So that's different than the layout of the rest of the pages. So you don't need one wireframe per page. You need one wireframe per type of page. So pages that have the same basic layout, you don't need to create a wireframe for each individual page. If you want further examples, if you Googled web page wireframe, you'll get them. Website name, customer quotes, video, some other stuff, and a footer. This is a sketch. Doesn't need to be extremely detailed. All right. The next step is a prototype. And we'll talk about the prototype next week. But in a nutshell, think of the prototype of your website as being like a rough draft for a paper. Here we've spent all the time planning. We've said what the goals are. We've said what content we're going to have. We've said how it's going to be structured and how each individual page is going to be laid out. Now we're going to make some web pages. And we're going to make those web pages in rough draft form so that we can get feedback on them and make changes on them. All right? Because all this planning is great, but a lot of times customers don't really know how to give a lot of feedback until they actually see web pages. Then they can say, oh, wait a minute. You know, a wireframe like that is kind of hard to critique. But when you actually see a web page, you can say, no, I want the navigation smaller, and I want the header to be bigger, and so on and so forth. So think of that as being the rough draft. Now, we'll talk about this more next time, but 
One nice thing about the way that CSS works is we can actually provide the user with a couple different prototypes that they can look at and choose. All right. We can style it one way and take the exact same pages and apply a different style sheet to give them an option so that they can look at it and say, do I like page A better or page B? And we can do that without completely duplicating our work. We're just redoing the CSS. That's where we'll pick up next time, taking our wireframe sketches and turning them into actual web pages that can serve as a prototype. All right. Uh, that's all I had today. We'll see you in lab. Um, that's it.